Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. On behalf of my, my colleagues, I want to make sure my, yeah, my mute's off. On behalf of my colleagues, um, Hava Lipsick Hautauer from the Konar Center and Noah Boyle from the Center for Civic Engagement, I welcome you to this evening's program. This evening, our keynote speaker will be Lara Swartz from American University. And tonight's lecture is entitled, Be the Architect of Your Own Voice. And she will help us all explore the complex issues around civil discourse and how we can engage in dialogue, even when there's significant dissonance or disagreement. During these past, excuse me, during these past 12 months, we have been particularly challenged and in many ways traumatized as we have witnessed the violence in communities of color, the social injustice as a result of profound systemic racism, and the assault on our democracy with the capital insurgents. So much has been done to further polarize our communities that it's very hard to feel safe in having an honest conversation and discussions that are grounded in empathy, values, respect, and an appreciation for humanity. However, as an institution of higher education, we must be willing to courageously examine tensions around freedom of speech, political polarization, and inclusion. The ways that we can do this is by increasing our understanding of different perspectives while fostering an inclusive and learning environment and by identifying ways to work together to create a campus community that values free speech while at the same time aligns with the mission, vision, and values of Nazareth College. As we continue to strive to create a community of belonging, tonight we will listen, and Laura says it'll be an engaging, uh, interactive presentation, but we'll listen and learn to how to engage in intergroup dialogue and bravely seek common understanding across lines of difference. At this point in time, I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Beth Paul, our president, to offer some of her opening remarks. Hello, everyone. It is really wonderful to be here with all of you this evening. You've probably learned about me uh, so far that I speak from my heart. And I have to say, my heart has been uh, pretty full and active this week. So I, I want to share with you um, a snapshot of where my heart is. And I can't say that it's fully uh, articulate, but I'll do, I'll do my best at giving you a snapshot. You know, as I think about Tuesday's verdict, um, yes, I, I do believe it's a defining and an important moment. I also believe that the killing at the same moment of Makia Bryant is also a defining and important moment. So it's, it's, you know, really made me reflect the conversations this week. There's been so much talk about, so what, what makes the murder of George Floyd different or what has made it able to penetrate the consciousness of our nation compared to the many, 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 many other violations of humanity um, that that we haven't seen or that we don't see. Um, okay, it was recorded, so we see it. We've seen it over and over and over again. Is that what makes it different? And to me, that just feels pathetic. So I found myself in great reflection this week about how is it that we are so ignorant as a nation, me as a person? Um, what What is that all about? Well, Yes, it is human nature to not see or to turn away from information that's contrary to uh, my own experiences or my own beliefs. Well, that's someone's truth that we're disregarding. And when we denigrate someone else's humanity, we lose our humanity. And I believe many are lost. So one of the things that I really appreciate, and Lara, I think you're going to really appreciate too this evening, is that we're part of a learning community that endeavors to journey on the side of humanity and justice. And I truly believe that we are working at this. And I truly believe that we have a long way to go. What I know is that civil dialogue and listening 
is an integral part of our individual and collective journey. And we need listening and dialogue more than ever, especially right now. You know, you think about this year and a half that we have spent in this weird, really not human state of being separated, of being isolated from one another. We need that connection more than ever. The truth is that too many people in our community and in communities around the world are hurting and they're not feeling heard. In our community, for example, I cannot truly know what this year's unending racial traumas feel like to my BIPOC colleagues and students. I don't know, I can't know, given my own position in this society. And I push myself every day to know. I think about it all the time and my heart and my ears are very open. So what are we gonna do to start listening better? So Lara, I'm so pleased that you are here this evening to help us with this conversation that I think is just so integral to where we are today and so integral to our humanity. I also wanna thank the group of staff and faculty who have been involved in planning this and who have really been involved through the year in deep conversation about how to engage our community in moving forward together in, in this pursuit of justice and humanity. I'm really committed to working with each and every one of you tonight, but also in an ongoing way to stay present for truth telling, for truth hearing, for being moved, for caring, and for taking proactive action. So I thank everyone for joining together tonight. And I thank you every day for working for the sake of humanity and justice. And I'm very honored to be on this journey with you. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, good evening. My name is Mackenzie Gerider. I am a graduate assistant for the Conrad Center for Tolerance and Jewish Studies and for Community and Belonging. Please welcome our speaker this evening, Laura Schwartz. Laura Schwartz founded and directs the American University Project on Civil Discourse, which supports students in developing their skills as listeners, communicators, and learners. She recently served as a fellow at the University of California National Center for Free Speech and Civil Engagement, where she developed tools for promoting robust and inclusive dialogue in college classrooms. She is co-author of How to College, What to Know Before You Go and When You're There, a guide to transition from high school to college. Schwartz draws upon her work as a civil rights advocate and communications strategist in teaching students and others to handle complex questions and navigate disagreement. Please uh, welcome Professor Schwartz. Thank you so much for that warm welcome, all of you. My name is Lara Schwartz, and before I start my slides, I do um, really want us to be in conversation together. And I hope that rather be, than being a guest, sort of an alien landing in your learning community, that for this time that we have together, um, I can be part of your learning community and we can learn together. So I do want us to um, intertwine our, all of our voices and all of our listening um, together um, as your university president indicated, um, discourse includes listening, community is about listening. And this is actually one of the skills that I'm really wanting to um, foreground tonight. In order to do so, I wanna be listening to you. So I'd actually like to start with just a little icebreaker um, um, exercise utilizing the chat function, which you all have to find out how we all are tonight. And this is an exercise that one of my student facilitators introduced me to from her, from her time as in working in theater troops. And so my question for you for the chat is this, what color is your mood tonight? What color are you bringing to, um, to this space that we're in together? And I'll, I'll join in too. seeing you a little more deeply than just your names and hopefully we'll see you more robustly purple and gold. It's beautiful. So one thing about this exercise, it gets us talking to each other and it gives me a little bit of a snapshot of you. But of course, 
as soon as we type um, what our color is into this space, all kinds of things can be happening, both in how we listen and maybe in our metacognition, oh, our considering yeah. ourselves. Yeah. Sounds so like someone's um, family is joining us for the moment. Um, For example, I might type yellow in this as I did in the sense of trying to evoke um, that I'm feeling a bit of a glow in me with excitement of being here. Um, but someone might very reasonably interpret that to mean like, well, maybe she's feeling fearful. Or someone might be typing blue in reflection of um, that they have seen the sky, the spring sky out today and that it moved them. Um, and then wonder, is this being perceived as I am blue, like I have the blues and I'm not happy. Um, all of these things are obviously socially constructed and they're very personal. And so if the only thing we asked one another was what color is our mood um, tonight, we wouldn't really get to know one another well at all. Um, but every communicative act, at least I find, um, in it spurs me to want to ask another question, you know, um, um, what, what does blue mean to Pete? Is it a good thing? Um, what is, what does green mean to Dev Parna? What I, what more can I know of this? And maybe what do they think of my typing yellow? How am I coming off to the community that I'm with? And one of the things that I really do want to explore tonight um, is this sense that how we present ourselves to our communities, how we're seen in communities, and how hard it is um, to sort of always be working toward a more perfect community, a more perfect sense of communication with one another. So I'm going to start my slides and move toward, are people seeing my slides? Great. Um, and move toward um, my big idea slide. And I'm just going to take a moment to re up my participants box here. Because although I have hunks of time that are dedicated to me sort of speaking outward to you, and hunks of time that I have dedicated, you know, on my outline and slides to be asking questions where we kind of workshop an idea. I actually also hope people feel free to raise their hand if they feel moved to um, reflect or connect with the material as it's happening to, um, um, I do, you know, I am far away and I have not visited your campus in person, but I would like to feel as accessible as I can. Um, and obviously in our Zoom world, especially those of us who have been teaching this year, as I have, we know that we don't, we, we don't have that automatic feedback about what we're saying that we're very used to in a room full of people with whom we can make eye contact, um, pause and, and, and take in. Um, we, the, the sense of that energy in the room isn't a tool that we have for listening to and understanding one another. So to the extent that you want that to happen by way of the chat or the hand raise, um, you should feel free to see us all as conversants rather than sort of an authority and a group of people um, coming to hear that authority. Um, I think I would be a very disappointing authority, actually. So um, uh, it's not my wish to be authoritative. Um, so tonight um, in this talk, I, I do have my talk broken into two pieces that very much reflect your president's introduction of me. There's a component that I want to discuss that's about laying the groundwork for robust, open, free, intellectually curious, question-loving dialogue, um, it, particularly in classroom spaces, although we can certainly talk about other campus spaces from student activities to guest speakers to what it's like on the quad and in the dining halls and things. And then the other part, the, the second part of, um, of my talk and, or, and our shared wor workshop of ideas um, I'd like to focus on how in an atmosphere where people are being generous one, with one another, um, generous and seeing one another as good faith actors, giving each other a lot of um, latitude to, to try, make mistakes, learn and grow, how in an 
in an atmosphere like that, which I do believe is essential to um, robust and inclusive dialogue in college campuses, I feel it's essential to doing what we're in college to do. How do we build equity? Because free speech and intellectual freedom, academic freedom, are remarkable tools of liberation. And they are also, like so many other aspects of our built life and our built society, unequally burdensome. So the burdens of a system of robust academic dialogue and free speech around topics like, for example, as your president mentioned, police violence, inequity, climate disaster, um, these burdens fall unequally. Um, and there's more catching up for some people to do than others. So there might be responsibilities and homework for many of us to do to catch up with our community members who are all too familiar with some of the important topics um, that it's so essential we engage with in this time. So I do have some big ideas that I want you to think about. If today was a course, these would be sort of my learning objectives on the syllabus for our semester. But these are the big ideas that are going to infuse tonight's conversation and that I hope to interweave into the whole thing. So first, there is a steep transition from K to 12 um, rules, so our, our schooling before college, um, and K to 12 communities to college. A lot of the buzz and narrative and media narrative about the extent to which colleges and the students who attend them are doing well with producing robust, free, uh, rigorous, and respectful dialogue um, speaks to a deficit somehow in our current generation, that they're insufficiently open-minded or don't have enough appreciation for the First Amendment. I am I'm a lawyer who loves our First Amendment and I don't find that to be accurate at all. What I do think is that thing, the rules and expectations change enormously from high school where you can be um, penalized and in some places, you know, find yourself in the school to prison pipeline for expressions such as your bra strap, the shape of your body um, and your political t-shirt to a college environment that is much different from that. And overwhelmingly, even in wonderful schools like the one where I teach and this school here, um, that transition is actually entirely implicit. Um, so I, I, one big idea I want us to think about together is the transition from K to 12 life and the communities students come from to college life and the, and the communities that, student, that, that colleges are. The second big idea that I want to infuse into tonight is that we have to model and encourage listening and reading with informed generosity. So what do I mean by informed generosity? We hear a lot about courage and resilience. And those are really important goals. I'm often hesitant myself as a person with a lot of privilege and who at least in my classrooms is the person who holds the power to focus too extensively on courage and resilience um, because it takes away the focus on my responsibility to make things fair and to pave the way for equity. And sometimes I do have concerns that when we're asking people to be resilient, what we're saying is that they should be very good at putting up with things that maybe they shouldn't have to be resilient or without. Um, I do though think that we, can, um, that we can model and request generosity. And by generosity, I mean approaching our discuss, fellow discussants, our classmates, our fellow administrators and faculty, our own students, the people we live and work with, with a presumption that they've come to this space known as college for the same reason that we have, because they deeply care about learning, self-improvement, and possibly even improving the world. Um, now, I say informed generosity because this ain't my first rodeo. It's 2021, and I am aware of the presence of trolls. Um, in communities that are working really well, maybe trolls aren't top of mind. I know that as we've all learned to teach on Zoom, um, many of us have dealt with having to use security measures just to keep trolls from, from turning what's supposed to be an educational space into 
one where there's some kind of other performance or even harassment going on. Um, and I think we all recognize that there are students who might think that they are acting in good faith who honestly um, bring a devil's advocate position and a combative debate position into their class um, that's a lot closer to trolling than informed generosity. So I say informed generosity because I'd like everybody to have the benefit of the doubt from each of us, but not to be asking our students to, you know, constantly be like Charlie Brown, um, uh, trusting Lucy more than he should with the football and that they'll have a bit of power to protect themselves from times when a conversation isn't held in good faith. Um, the third thing, and this is really, it's, it's aimed at the, the faculty and, and other educators, but, but this is important to students too, because I think this is every faculty member's goal, but we don't always tell you. And it's really important if you're a student on here that you know that the community standards that we set and how we communicate with one another in a learning community, they relate to the learning objectives and disciplinary standards that we have um, for our courses and for our courses of study. So I think often it can be dizzying for a student coming into the college environment. This goes back to item one, um, the transition, um, maybe getting their first feedback on a paper or a comment in class um, or a reflection on the, you know, on, on Blackboard or Canvas um, that isn't as glowing as, as that effort might have in, um, in high school. And you've been told your whole life that college is different, but you, you haven't even really been told how. And then in this environment that as your president has noted is very polarized, um, it is reasonable and likely more and more I have found for students to assume that if they're getting feedback um, that's negative about the way that they're communicating, whether it's in their writing, their classroom discourse or otherwise, that this is a reflection of their professor disagreeing with them ideologically. And so helping them understand, you know, there, there are good and bad ideas or there are right and wrong things to say, but they aren't tied to how you and I vote. They're tied to what we're trying to accomplish together here. And for me as a teacher, I feel like I've become better and better as a professor and better and better as a facilitator of tough conversations when I've invested time in the groundwork of trying to um, make sure that everybody in the room understands what we're trying to accomplish together here. So I tend to spend a lot of time talking on learning objectives. Um, item four, and this is a big one, a mindset of shared exploration is preferable to civil debate. So I actually get asked a lot to come and do a speech or a talk or a workshop along the lines of, will you come to my school or my workplace or my town and tell me how we can get people to debate more civilly and i say thank you so much for being interested in my work no um no i won't because that's not the goal any of us i'm a lawyer who comes out of a political advocacy background any of us who have watched debates know that Debates aren't actually how learning happens. All kinds of things can happen as a result of a debate. You can learn how tough or quick your preferred candidate it is, for example. But if you were sending a person to learn something about how policy is done or which things are good and which ideas hold up and which ideas don't, um, you actually wouldn't send them to watch most debates because that's not what's happening there. It's combat. I also don't find it to be the ideal approach for colleges where students are supposed to be in the process of forming their opinions as opposed to defending them, however kindly. And certainly defending an opinion kindly is a better outcome in a college environment than people attacking each other, I would agree. But I think if we're at the point of students um, engaging in civil debate, we might have missed a step. So the um, unofficial motto of the project on civil discourse is love the questions themselves which comes from Rainer Maria Rilke's um, letters to a young poet. And I, I usually close these, um, these talks with that full quotation about loving the questions themselves. And I, I most certainly will tonight. Um, so rather than encouraging students to sort of 
put on soft bo boxing gloves so as not to harm one another in expressing and defending their ideas, um, getting students more, and, and their professors of, of any age, more into the mindset of a shared exploration and a shared quest for truth in which they can collaborate in attempting to discern what to do with data points. And, and maybe they'll end up debating about, um, you know, what conclusions might we draw from what we're learning and what priorities might we have about what we do about it. Um, but the beginning point is supposed to be the questions. And finally, and this is where I'll spend um, some part of this talk, um, our responsibilities, you'll hear me talk a lot about, I don't really love talking about speech rights, free speech, the First Amendment. What can the government stop you from staying? What can the president or the provost or, you know, or the dean stop you from saying? Um, I wanna talk about our responsibilities um, as communicators in a community. So moving from a framework from the, what do I have the right to say, which in all honesty is more, is more interesting to toddlers and tyrants um, than adults and college students to what should I be saying? And within that understanding that we are wanting to be a learning community that is generous, that is open, that is forgiving of people of being in works in progress, that we also have to start demanding of ourselves a degree of cultural competence, sensitivity, um, listening skills, humility, the capacity to hear criticism, apologize and move on. And that doing these things isn't only necessary to our shared quest for truth so that we can all be you know, better scholars, better future leaders in our students' case. Um, but it's necessary so that Nazareth College, like any college in any community, is equally accessible to people with marginalized identities and equally accessible to people um, who are currently either under attack um, through from, from aspects of our society outside of the college or who are just people for whom the college was not originally designed coming in, um, coming into a space that is still catching up um, with the diversity and you know, breadth of, of needs um, and identities that today's students have. Um, so I have a story that I feel like is the emblematic story of the big question for productive discourse. And the big question to me is, why is this so hard? So here's my little anecdote. It's my what I did on my Veterans Day vacation. You might remember a time when we used to meet on campuses all together and go into buildings together and, and, and convene. And, and, it was, and, and there were things that were wonderful about that. And we'll get back to that again. A few years ago, before I founded the Project on Civil Discourse, um, those of you who follow current events might have noticed that the 2016 presidential election was somewhat of a big news item at the time. Um, and I teach and work and live in Washington, D.C. at a school that is heavily, heavily self-branded and identified as the most politically active campus um, in the country. Um, and amazingly to me, as somebody who, who you know, cares deeply about um, our veteran and military, um, you know, and ROTC community on campus, um, my university had never done a Veterans Day observance with a full, you know, flag and a speaker and ceremony on the quad until November 2016, which, as you know, Veterans Day comes right after um, comes right after election. Um, so it was a time of uh, our campus had already, after the election, had ruptures um, among students. Um, there had been hate-motivated incidents directed at African-American students. Um, there had been students, conversely, who, who were displeased with the election outcome who had burned a flag, which was not in violation of any, any rule at American University, but is um, 
symbolism that many, many people in this country found, find extremely offensive. It's constitutionally protected speech at a public university, but a is private, so it could have been punishable speech. And so it would be safe to say that people were on edge. Um, the campus was figuring out all manner of things, including, for example, whether um, campaign promises relating to our students who are undocumented or came from majority Muslim countries um, might, might be affecting students who actually attended the school. So I went to attend the Veterans Day observance, um, feeling the weight of the challenge of this time on my shoulders, knowing that there had been bias incidents, that there were students fighting with one another, um, that ruptures that, that are gonna be familiar to you as members of our American community and, and of, of, a, of a college learning community, you know, I'm sure experienced in some way or another. Um, and as I was standing out on um, the university quad, um, get, getting ready for the flag ceremony to begin with a colleague, my colleague said, oh, wow, look, what, what are these people doing? And I, and I followed the direction of her eyes and I saw five men wearing black, silently traversing the campus walking toward the flagpole where the Veterans Day observance was about to begin. Now, as a civil rights lawyer with a strong, strong commitment to freedom of expression, including freedom of protest, I felt very powerfully the sense that if our students wanted to be protesting the election results or even militarization or US military policy, that I'm the person who's there for them. And I felt really strongly as someone who's done crisis communications for national organizations and was in the process of trying to develop civil discourse, you know, programming for my school. I felt strongly that I really didn't want my university to be the next um, university on the news with these disrespectful, horrible liberal students protesting Veterans Day when veterans were trying to be honored. And I just didn't want today to be a horrible day because it seemed I knew some veterans who were putting on this um, uh, to putting on this first observance, which was set up to be a beautiful um, recognition of their contributions and at AU. And so my colleague said, "What do we do?" And I was like, "I, I, I don't know. I, I'll talk to them." And I sort of strode across the quad, self-appointed to go figure out what's going on very uncertain of myself. And the words that came out of my mouth were, please just don't. And one of the young men in black who was somberly striding across the quad turned to me and said, hi, Professor Schwartz, we're the acapella group. We're gonna be singing the national anthem at the Veterans Day event. And my whole self just sort of went like, and I remember going home that day and my husband was like, how's your day? And I was like, I very nearly beat up an acapella group. So medium go, okay. Um, and I, I mentioned this story because community is hard. <laughs> it felt in the moment, it was just me being silly and worried on edge, you know, the, they were wearing black because they were going to be the singers and they all were, you know, in coordinated outfits um, for the occasion. Um, it felt like a moment where something was going to go wrong and people in a, in a diverse, angry um, community um, in the exercise of their freedoms and in the exercise of their beliefs and values might have been about to clash at a time when it felt really strongly to me that the best thing that could happen would be, you know, if we could all be in, in community with one another. So I don't know if I did the right thing um, at all. It worked out to be very low stakes. And if they had planned a protest that I had disrupted, I'm actually not sure today whether that would have been the right thing to do. I still don't know whether that would have been the right thing to do. It works out to be a silly story but it works out to be a story that really frames the biggest, toughest question about civil discourse and community. Why is this so hard? 
Um, so if you might, either with unmuting and raising your hand or in the chat, um, as I move to some of my advice to you, I'm wondering if you would be willing to share with me and with the group what makes it hard to be charged with facilitating um, creating a community where people are both robustly free to share their ideas and values um, and um, but also are respected and treated well. So I'm wondering what your opinion is about either side calling the other horrible or wrong. We are having civil discourse then shouldn't everyone's viewpoint be considered valid? That's a great question. Um, so I would argue no. If we're having civil discourse, then everyone's opinion shouldn't be considered valid. And the, and you hate to go there, right? But let's go all the way to Nazis, right? If because it happens. I mean, this is called the paradox of tolerance, and we've done some. So Popper's Karl Popper's paradox of tolerance. The idea is in a limitlessly tolerant society, intolerance will eventually win out, and it goes something like this. There's someone in your campus community who is, I'm not gonna say they're a bad person and I do think we can separate ideas from people, right? All of us who have kids, right? We separate our kids like the joy that they take in TikTok and really bad music from their value as a human being. We can do this all the time, right? My kid actually has better taste in everything but, than me, but, but anyway. Um, but let's say there's a person in your community who I, I, I have done consulting at a university where there was a great rupture because there was literally a grad student who was a member of the group Identity of Ropa, which is like a white nationalist group. And at a public university, they can't just kick this person out or take away their grad assistantship for their membership in a political group, for their nonviolent allegiance with, with what amounts to, right, this is a First Amendment issue that doesn't apply at AU or Nazareth, but de definitely does in our public square and certainly does in our public universities. Um, so we have that issue with the First Amendment binding us if, if, we're, if, if we're in a public institution or our school has those kind of rules, binding us not to excommunicate that person or deny them employment. Um, but we also have our boundaries of truth and decency to other people around us to ultimately say colleges aren't places where hashtag all ideas matter. In fact, colleges are the opposite of that. Because I went all the way to write the Nazi in your midst, right? the identity of Europa, it really is a white supremacist group. You know, if I have a thousand students and one of them is a member of identity of Europa, I might be compromising my learning community significantly if I say to the other 999, Sparky's views as, as demonstrated in this white nationalist group, they, they're equally valid to your view that racial justice is good. Sparky's view that, you know, 30% of you aren't quite all the way human is pretty valid to me. Um, you know, I, I would say no. Now, we have smaller versions of this, and this is what I mentioned with learning objectives. Um, it doesn't always have to go always to the grad assistant who's literally a white nationalist. You will have students who will bring you, who will write you a paper that's not meeting the disciplinary standards of your class. We give grades for ideas and writing all of the time. Now, the thing that's hard, one of the things that's hard is helping students understand the difference between, I've marked you down because one of the standards that applies in my discipline is that you have to use credible evidence to support your claims. You've claimed the election was stolen. That is a debunked claim founded only on lies. And here's you know the countervailing evidence that that, that is a fabrication. And I've marked you down because you hold the view held by the 45th president of the United States and I don't like him. And one of the things as teachers that we do this all the time, it's what we're, it's what we're actually great at, is helping our students write the paper that, that, that does the thing that, that it's supposed to do, that it utilizes the kinds of evidence and, and inquiry that, that, that whatever our discipline is involves and, and comes to something and creates something 
um, that, that represents that kind of work. And I think what becomes really hard for us in a time that's very polarized as faculty is that um, if we have to answer, you know, no, this, this is an F because, it, because all of the claims are unfounded, that we understand that we're in a space that this, this student might go to college fix or campus reform and say, I, I, was, I was given an F because I wanna make America great again and my professor thinks otherwise. Um, so that requires a degree of our, our institutions having our back. But I would say that, um, that it's uncivil in a lot of ways to treat all ideas as equivalent in the sense of the intolerant view, you know, I'm going to be just as tolerant of my, of, of this idea that, you know, the Holocaust didn't happen or black people aren't um, as hardworking as white people or something like that as other views, you're gonna wind up sort of hurting the people that that view is targeted at. But as well, when we take stuff that's kind of junk um, in the marketplace of ideas and we tell our students this junk is not junk, um, out of some kind of hope that they don't feel politically offended or excluded. Um, the problem is then they're not learning and then we're not actually giving them that education. Um, so so my, my very long answer to your question is, is, is no. I, um, but everybody's humanity is valid. Um, and I think we can separate people from problems. So the fact that a person brought in um, you know, a claim from a debunked website or a conspiracy theory source, the fact that they were wrong there and that wasn't college work doesn't mean they don't have it in them to become very successful in that course and even in that conversation that day. And I think um, this is part of the informed generosity I want to talk about, giving people a resilience to hear, you didn't get it right, but, but we all still believe in you. Um, is, is a hard part of teaching in this time. I hope that answered your question. Um, so this, this, the combination of my story about Veterans Day and your colleague Beth's great question about both sides um, is why I don't spend a lot of time, even though I'm a lawyer, giving free speech speeches because um the question of what authority figures can stop you from saying it's pretty simple i mean i can do a whole good semester on on first amendment stuff and it's getting more complex now but but that's not actually most of the question that we have to ask ourselves when we're trying to hold meaningful conversations in college we're not asking what can what can i punish or what can one say without being punished trying to ask you know, what we're supposed to be doing. So besides my much more lofty Rilke quote about loving the questions, my other sort of operative um, philosophy for this program comes from Jurassic Park. Um, your scientists were so preoccupied with whether or not they could, they never stopped to think if they should. And I really like to get students and faculty both, whether it's the students who have an idea to share or the faculty who are convinced, you know, my my standing firm on not using your pronouns or not um you know not um declining to utilize the slur that that is in the literature i'm teaching you know as a statement of my rights kind of misses the boat um because what we need to be thinking about is are is the way that we're communicating productive and not whether it's allowed um so a speech rights lens says we have a rebuttable presumption. So the a rebuttable presumption, I'll get into a little lawyer speak. Most, most of us in the U US culture are seeing a, a lot of cop procedurals and courtroom procedurals know the rebuttable presumption of innocence, right? So we're presumed innocent in a criminal court until proven get guilty. So my rebuttable presumption is, is of the right, in a, spe in a free speech lens, you know, are we censoring? Are we not? What are people free to do? There's a rebuttable presumption of the right to speak. It centers the speaker. So we're not asking, is this good for the community? Is this, is this the best way to get the ideas across? We're essentially asking the question, you know, should Professor Smith get to include the N slur when he's teaching um, Huckleberry Finn or not? 
you know, does he have that right? It's centering what he wants and is allowed to do. Considers only whether speech is permissible and protected, not whether it's productive and effective. A speech responsibilities lens, on the other hand, gives a rebuttable presumption that concerns about speech are made in good faith. So in a speech responsibilities lens, you'd never say that that student who says, I'm offended, I don't like that, that's a microaggression, is trolling or trying to make your life hard. We'll believe people when they say they're hurt. We'll believe people when they say they've gotten it wrong. Just like we believe Professor Smith when he says, it's not that I'm trying to attack you, but I, but I think I should probably use the word that appears in this book. It centers the listeners. Um, communication <laughs> doesn't exist just for us to hear ourselves talk. It's so hard to keep a hold of that feeling in the Zoom world when we're not in the room, getting a sense from people, are you leaning in toward me, are we together? But communication, whether we're students, professors, administrators, community members, family, is supposed to center listeners. It's supposed to accomplish something. So a speech responsibilities lens says, asks me to think not have I, have I colored outside of the lines? Have I, have I found a way that I'm, I'm allowed to do everything I want to do? But ask yourself to, well, am I accomplishing everything I set out to do? Whether it's persuading, educating, connecting, making people feel good, fulfilling an assignment. It focuses on whether speech is effective. And the bottom line as well with a paradigm shift from rights to responsibilities, and I encourage this as a mode of talking with with our students, if we're faculty or with, you know, people that we're, we're trying to get by in, a lot of the time what you hear is that there are these two things in tension, freedom of speech and diversity and inclusion. And how do you have both? And I don't find that to be true at all. I would say that instead, of, I think it's a matter of framing. Instead of framing requests for kinder, more precise, more inclusive speech, as limitations on freedom, I would like it if we could all in a learning community think of them as opportunities for kindness. So I am not, and that is the difference between calling someone out and saying, you know, I hereby punish you for utilizing the wrong word or phrase and calling them in and saying, I think you would be much more effective if you didn't use this language that I'm here to let you know is highly charged, you're calling someone articulate, has a history, and it made you come off less effective and less inclusive, would you consider otherwise? That was actually an opportunity for you to be kind to the person you were calling in and an opportunity for that community member to become a much more effective communicator in that space. Um, so a little bit back to our shared conversation. There's been a lot of talk about how it's very hard to have conversations on campuses. Um, and I feel like um, both um, Dr. Durant Jones and Dr. Paul set the stage for this talk very well, describing um, polarization, inequity, um, racial violence, all of, all of the backdrop, the pandemic, all of the backdrop in which we're living, learning and educating. Um, one narrative that I always see is that um, we're in a crisis of self-censorship on campuses, that people don't really feel free to say what they want to say. Now, I'm not someone who tends to think that people feeling free to say anything they want is the outcome we're looking for in a college. Like, for example, when I teach law in the political system tomorrow and I ask a question, my sincere hope is that people are feeling free to answer the question asked with some kind of reference to the course materials and assigned readings as opposed to, you know, a new recipe for cookies or a new gripe about, you know, a thing going on. Um, so I'm not sure that people feeling totally free to communicate with no constraints is what we were ever looking for in college because arguably we wouldn't need college then. But nonetheless, there is, there is a sense out there when students are communicating when asked in polls that they feel that it's hard to communicate about controversial topics. And the thing that's fascinating to me is why they feel 
that way. And so this is a recent, um, this, is a, this is recent survey. Um, the perceived consequences of giving uh, views on a controversial topic. And I'll tell you, tons of research confirms that professors are not penalizing students for disagreeing with them politically and are actually not penalizing students even that often for um, utilizing things that don't meet the standards out of, out of fear of, of political sort of dissension. But the number one thing that students are afraid of is this, 63, 60.3% say other students would criticize my views as offensive. So let's workshop this for a moment. If someone came to you and said, and, and today was a staff meeting, a faculty meeting, or a, or a university town hall, a college town hall, on the, the problem of, you know, a lot of our students are worried that if they speak on a controversial topic, other students would criticize my views as offensive. What would you say, how would you describe the problem? What is wrong? And how would you solve it? And I hope people will feel free to either add to the chat or if they'd like, raise their hand. I have the participants thing up so I can see you and call on you if you'd like. You're in charge of addressing this stat. 60.3% of students are, are afraid other students will criticize their views as offensive. We're a school, if that's a problem, maybe it's not a problem, if that's a problem, how would you address it? Problem, students are reactionary to one another. So can you say a little more about that? So like, in, in other words, they, they're, they're critiquing too much maybe? Well, I'm just, I haven't thought about this before. So it's, it's um, really interesting to see this data, but I think students are afraid of being ostracized um, by somebody else. I had students actually in my own classroom, now that I think back to it, they just didn't use the same language, but said that, like, I want to be part of, I want to be an ally in the Black Lives Matters movement, for example, a white um, student in my class shared with me after class, but she's afraid of using the wrong language and apparently has had experiences where she felt, you know, she got looks or it wasn't responded to in a way that, um, made her feel safe, I guess, speaking about the issue. So I don't know if that's perceived in, in someone's head or if there's a reality to it. Well, you know, there might be a reality. So one thing that I'll say is, is that this is where I feel like, so I'm a lawyer, but sometimes I wanna put on my, like I try to earn my, my junior sociologist badge and say, if we center the student who's worried about getting the eye roll or being in a public space an inadequate ally um we might we might see the problem differently than if we center for example the black students in the room um so low self-esteem or fix restricts viewpoints and learning they feel like they are wrong that they can't speak on the topic talk about how they are perfect so I think um, this looks like Susan as the response talk about how they're presenting their views I think people are afraid of having their views challenged. Give students the opportunity to educate themselves further and deepen their opinion as they feel confident. I think these are some good um, responses. One thing that I would say is that I often see this set of stats deployed to in service of the, I think, unsupported and unsupportable assumption that colleges should be making more space, uh, sometimes for conservative views, sometimes for, for students who maybe don't share as much allyship with Black Lives Matter. It's not what I'm seeing. One thing that I'm seeing is that if students are afraid of being criticized of having their views seen as offensive, there's a couple of ways you could go. There's the direction that some people could go, and I'd say this is characterized by like maybe the social media frenzy around the concept of cancel culture, that you say, okay, minoritized students, liberal students, progressive students, 
stop telling people they're wrong. Stop telling people they're getting it wrong because they're afraid. But there's another way to look at it that says to me, if I'm in a learning community and what I'm hearing from students is I'm afraid of hearing from other students that they're offended or that I got it wrong. My next question, and it's kind of a cognitive behavioral question is, what do you think will happen if a fellow student says, the thing that you said felt wrong to me or misrepresents my community or offended me in some way? What do you think will happen? Do you think it's bad, for example, for a student who's done some of the work to try and be an ally, but isn't all the way there in understanding yet, when she takes a crack at it to receive feedback from her peers? Speaks to the power of peers, someone wrote, I wonder if people know that their views could be perceived as offensive. Does that mean that they may have a sense that the views don't fit with some of the premises that were listed at the start of this presentation? So I do think people really, really fear that their views will be seen as offensive. I do. And I, th and I do think that that is a challenge. Now, I'm an outlier in the sort of campus free speech sort of discourse because I do have a concern that um, too much of that discourse centers complaining that Black students, the trans students, that students with minoritized identities are saying, the way you're doing this isn't good enough, it's hurting me in some way. And that that is the problem, that that makes college uncomfortable for other people who don't see it that way. And I think looking at that communication, which is free speech, which is robust intellectual discourse from a deficit model is um, it's just exercising power in one direction. I don't know that it's necessarily making people feel more free. Um, one person wrote, I want to be held accountable. Um, I think the thing that that is really hard for all of us, and I think it's particularly hard for our, for our students, is there doesn't seem to be that much space between being completely approved of and being exiled to Elba. So the idea that if somebody says, you know, what Lisa just said offended me, to me that that erases, you know, my experience. What happens next is sort of hard for students to get their head around. Um, what happens next in K-12 education, and remember I mentioned that I, I really wanted to bring in K-12 education. What happens next in K-12 education is that if you said something that colors outside the lines, you can be punished. K-12 has sort of a command and punish approach to expression. And it's everything from that being the case um, with, you know, your bra strap showing or you're wearing leggings or your shorts aren't as long as your fingertips or all of these ways in which we police um, students' expression of who they are that, that we stop doing in college. Um, but also of their, their political speech, um, this disruption standard that applies in K-12 education, students are told, you know, there's going to be an, a referee um, and that person's going to exercise authority, possibly even to punish. One of the, there, there's a couple of different transitions that happen in college. One of them is, is that the communication becomes more free. But another of them is that we have to start being creative about approaches to speech that we might not like very much outside of punishment. Now, a lot of our students are really, really familiar with themes and concepts of restorative justice when it comes to reforming our policing system, when it comes to deciding what our drug laws should look like, if anything, when it comes to talking about returning citizens and their roles in 
um, in society and in our democracy. Um, having a conversation about restorative justice when it comes to people whose so-called crime or so-called wrong is that they've their communication has crossed a boundary for someone in the community for some reason or other, ignorance, um, inadequate information, not sourced, whatever it might be, just an honest clash of ideas. And one of the things that we can be doing in a college community is a few things. One, really directing our students to have a restorative approach to one another. Two things can be true at once. Um, Sparky can be wrong about what it means to be a transgender person in your classroom. And she can be a person who's trying in good faith to learn. Um, and, you know, Lara can be offended and speak up, but ready to work with you again um, in, the in the future. So I recommend a framework for, for getting students ready to have conversations where they can simultaneously hear you know, what you said actually offended me for various reasons, like you weren't getting allyship right, and understand that to be part of a shared learning experience in which people can be wrong, but they got to try, and they can hear critique and understand that that critique is not attack. And I do, um, you know, faculty development workshops that are that are much longer than this, we talk about how to lay the groundwork for that at the course level and at the community level. Um, but this is the framework that I'd like you to consider for you know, classrooms in particular where um, simultaneously people can feel fairly free to share ideas, but they're also kind of ready to hear um, when another community member you know, isn't having it. So the first is that students really, and faculty, all of us, really have to understand the rules and norms that apply to our circumstances. And as I mentioned earlier in this talk, it's really important that we let our students know that there are norms of truth, relevance, um, information literacy, kindness, decency, non-harassment, non disciplinary standards that apply, that enable us to grade what they do and say because all of college is, is communicating and listening in some way. Um, and understanding the rules and norms that apply that sometimes are gonna result in assessment and understanding that there are rules um, and norms of communication in the classroom that are less free um, than on the quad or in the residence hall. Um, and that also include um, professors attempting to keep people um, being respectful of one another have to engage in self-reflection. I have students do, um, and we do at AU, incoming students do this whole questionnaire that asks them my two big questions, what do, you, what do I want for myself and what will I ask of myself, the two formative questions of college. But other questions reflecting on what kind of communicator or listener they, they are. I ask students who they want to make proud and I really like asking that question in a classroom full of students together. Who are you hoping to make proud and letting them share that with one another and establish um, you know, the shared ways in which they're emerging adults trying to get better at stuff um, in community. But I also ask students to set goals for their listening and learning. Be frank about, you know, am I good at hearing? You just hurt me. Why am I not good at hearing that? Do I need to practice reading stuff that's outside my comfort zone? Do I need to practice speaking up and saying that I'm offended because I usually just let people walk over me and then they never learn what it's like to be me in this space? Um, to listen and read with a mindset of informed generosity. I do think it's appropriate to sometimes tell our fellow students, for me as faculty to sometimes tell a student or for a student to tell another, you know, I think what you've just said is hurtful um, but I think that that should happen when the when when there's an educational possibility and it would be good if students can enter a classroom with a mindset that everyone here is here to learn and trying in good faith. Um, they're coming with imperfect information and the things that sort of come out of their mouths and body language 
are going to reflect their status as a person who is a work in progress trying to learn the same things we are and try to apply that mindset to professors as well. Um, students should learn to love questions and seek answers. Um, it is good when students use their voices in advocacy, but I think a lot of the time, um, and I see this at American, which is a place a lot of people go to study politics in, in the, you know, in the heart of, of the nation's capital. Um, I ask students at the beginning of the semester to tell me their goals and too many of them say, you know, I want to learn to support my opinions with evidence and I go, that's nice, but it would be even better if you learn to build your opinions from evidence. I think we have enormous power as professors to start our students with the hard questions and get them okay. I actually have my students in my first year class practice saying I don't know in front of one another the first day of class. It is incredibly hard for them to do. It can also be really freeing. And I remind them the most common correct answer in the history of the universe is I don't know. Um, and I don't know is better sometimes than trying to know something that's beyond your capacity. And finally, communicate to be understood. Um, it's one thing to communicate to own the libs or you know make someone look bad that they haven't done the reading or show show off or be giving a performance or telling other people who they are um but typically we can actually avoid being in a place where we are um where we are offending people if our real communication goal is just to be understood which can include asking questions when we really have Someone said, I think my family members need to do this too. One of my favorite workshops I've ever done was at a church near my school where the people in attendance were getting ready to either, this was before the pandemic, get, either getting ready to travel for Thanksgiving or have out of town relatives for Thanksgiving. And the workshop was about like, how do we do this? Like, how do we have our red and blue state you know, mixtures, how do we do Thanksgiving anymore in the country that we're in? And I feel like as much as on college campuses, we're, we're having a tough time in ways, like at least in my American constitution course, you know, I can say, fortunately, all we're talking about today is the fourth amendment, you know, um, you don't get to do that at the Thanksgiving table. Be like, oh, sorry, that's not relevant, Uncle Jed. You know, every, everything's fair game. Um, I, I, I'm going to sh make sure that I sh give give these slides to you all, but but I do share your president's statement that listening is um, one of the most, that teaching our students to listen and helping them model listening, but not just listening in the sense of, you know, you should be open to every idea. Um, um, because, because maybe you're not gonna have to be open to extremism or untruth or conspiracy theories. Um, but showing, um, showing that, that they actually see a part of their journey at school as engagement with peers' ideas and, and, and including, um, including accepting informed cr criticism of theirs. As a pedagogical note, I really like giving students structured peer critiquing opportunities because I actually think that being getting used to receiving criticism in a very structured way that's not like, gee, I think your personhood or your political identity are bad, but, but on specific things. I think people getting used to hearing this is how you could do better from students is really important. I just wanted to make sure, Lara, that you, before moving on to the next one, um, there was another question in there about what is the role of privilege in the dynamics? I'm sorry, Somebody I couldn't hear what mute. is... Someone is not on mute that should be, but... Um, Someone asked the question, what's the role of privilege in these dynamics um, and whose discomfort matters? That was actually also such a great on. question. And I realized I was going over, so I flipped forward away from these reflections. I do have these reflections that um, Hava, I'll share with you if people want to sort of, I, I have questions people can ask of themselves about, about their learning communities that I think are worthwhile. But this privilege question, I think, moves me to this part about fostering equity in the good faith classroom. Whose comfort matters is such a great question. So one of the comfort food ideas 
that we're fed. And I call them comfort food ideas because um, they really are comforting, but like a lot of comfort food is bad for you. <laughs> One comfort food idea is, and you see this sort of peddled on like, you know, the opinion page of the New York Times is college is about being uncomfortable, you know? And we should all, we should all stretch beyond our comfort zone. And I'm, I'm a fan of going beyond our comfort zone. I assign my students, you know, moot court positions that I know they'll dislike, right? I, that, that I make them represent the client that would, would be the opposite of what they want to do. But I often ask, you know, I'll often ask audiences, do you think college was meant to make people uncomfortable? And people are like, yes, absolutely. I'd be like, okay, you know, today it was raining really hard before you got to this um to to this lecture hall um what if i had told you you could not you know change your shoes like if you had gotten soaking wet and i made you do this whole lecture without getting out of you know the gross wet clothes um would the discomfort of your wet socks and your wet shoes and your cold pants against your legs in this air-conditioned lecture hall facilitate an improved experience of this workshop. And everybody's like, she's not. Like, that's a ridiculously stupid question. There's normative discomfort and non-normative discomfort. So the discomfort of hearing, I would argue, you use the word articulate to refer to me and that term has, has a history of as a racialized microaggression that assumes that black people's use of language isn't professional. And I would like you to use a different word. A person could be really uncomfortable hearing that, but they're receiving a favor in being given information as to how to be a better, you know, colleague, fellow student, community member, whatever it is, in not doing that anymore. They're being given information. They're being given it kindly. So they might feel really uncomfortable and their subjective experience might just be, you called me racist, I'm not racist. I have no racist bones. I just got x-rayed yesterday. But, but they actually probably are experiencing in, in getting this feedback that, that, that might embarrass them. And so maybe there's, maybe, maybe it's feedback best given in a really private way, you know, they're getting good education. Compare that to the student who is being told in a class, your identity makes you less human. People like you um, are basically criminal. Your idea that, you know, people like you are being hurt by police, you know, is, is a lie or it's just because people like you deserve it or anything pick pick a thing right there there was a case just before you know a federal court about a professor asserting his right not to use a trans student's pronouns and i, I think it came out wrong but think about the difference between the discomfort of hearing you totally misunderstood the reading and you need to rewrite because because you need to internalize what this reading is about that's that's education and the discomfort of hearing where are you really from, right? Nobody learns anything from that, right? That was a that was a sort of a microaggression often targeted against Asians. So I think um, privilege pay, plays into this idea of the good faith classroom, which is the classroom I want, the one where everyone can look at everyone else and say, we're not here with a bunch of trolls. And if we have trolls, Professor Schwartz will handle that in short order, right? Professors can handle trolls. Everybody else is at varying degrees of perfection, imperfection, and humanity. We're all just people. That is still not without a recognition of privilege, as, as our colleague in the chat mentioned. It's not an equitable classroom. Because every trans student has a PhD in what cisgender people think. Every black student in a predominantly white institution in America has a PhD on what white people think of, of a topic, right? There's an unequal degree of familiarity across difference between students of varying identities and 
a model that says it's really important we talk about George Floyd, it's really important we talk about police violence, it's really important we talk about privilege, it's really important we talk about all of these things that we're talking about, that doesn't put on the white, cis, Christian, non-disabled students a bit of responsibility to do some of that learning on their own turns the other students into unpaid educators. And, and makes and is asking them to be Lucy, you know, Charlie with Charlie Brown with the football at that point. Because if I always get a presumption of, of good faith and I don't have to do any work and I can kind of sashay into class and be like, where are you really from? Can I touch your hair? Because the other person hasn't done that work to make that classroom more equitable by learning the things that they disproportionately don't know. Right, I guarantee you, every transgender student and every black student in the in the um, in the room knows what not to do about the other group, and often that white, you know, non-trans, non-disabled person doesn't. If we're not also focusing on the responsibilities, what do I culturally have to be competent in when I come into the room? If I'm a professor, what does my syllabus have to look like? If I'm a student, what kinds of things do I have to read and understand? not just be willing to be graciously corrected and learn, but do some of that learning myself because my black classmate didn't come to college to teach me to be an anti-racist. She came to college to learn to be a CPA. And that's what she's busy doing. That's what she's paying for. That's what she's trying to do. Um, so privilege comes in because the idea of a classroom in which freedom to express oneself and share one's ideas and kick these ideas around is fairly robust and that we're not punishing and we're treating people like works in progress and giving them room and graciousness and generosity to learn that way is a room that's a bit more burdensome on the usual recipients of ignorance, people with a minoritized identity, unless everyone else, and that includes your fellow students, but it's really us faculty in making our syllabi reflect diverse voices. It's really our administrators and making sure our faculty are from a broad range of perspectives and, and are culturally competent. If we're not doing that work, this wonderful sort of robustly forgiving and curious classroom that I've created is actually an, an inequitable one. And we've all had that experience of where we're trying to talk about anything from health disparities to the portrayal of you know women in a certain work of literature or art um, we've all had that experience of realizing there's only there's often in spaces like my school and i think yours there might only be a handful of people in the room that this work of art or literature or law or government or news is actually speaking about um, and so taking that responsibility for shouldering some of that burden of that teaching and learning and asking students to carry that responsibility. And then that answers the question of our tough, our tough, tough problem of what do you do if you're afraid that someone's going to be offended? Well, this is college. Learn, right? The answer is often just learn. If you're afraid that you're going to get it wrong, you've come to the right place because in college we learn. We have to ask our other students to show a fair bit of grace with their fellow classmates and even professors and presidents learning processes. But at the end of the day, that responsibility to learn, it's still there and it's as much there with civil and productive discourse and free speech and um, being kind to, to all of our fellow community members as it is, you know, with calculus and accounting and physiology and psych one. Um, it's the same thing. It's just getting good at stuff. And that's what we're supposed to be in college for. Um, so I did want to make sure that um, it's not it's not a great lecture without a mean girls, Jeff. Um, I did want to make sure we had time for our Q&A. And I see there are a bunch of questions in the chat that I will look at now. So someone, um, Patricia, has, has written, can you speak a little more on how best to understand trolls and how to address them? 
So I would define a troll as someone whose goal in speaking um, or in asking a question sometimes is not to understand further or to educate further with regard to the course, you know, guidelines, but really to inflame or to provoke a reaction by um, community members. Um, so there are people who I see as professional trolls on the internet. Um, in the classroom, I think we can utilize our, um, we can utilize our clock, you know, our relevance um, uh, standards. All of us know that we have a certain amount of material we want to get through in a semester. And it's okay when people are really not offering into our, into our classroom space an opportunity to learn because what they're doing is trolling to say, you know, you're welcome to come talk to me about that in office hours, but but uh, I'm gonna recenter our conversation on, um, on the subject at hand, which is, you know, the Fourth Amendment. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a term in First Amendment law called the heckler's veto. And the idea of the heckler's veto is like, if something's so provocative and so sort of offensive to the larger community that you actually wanna censor it in order to avoid inflammation and, and the, the biggest example would be the old flag burning uh, bans that were that were struck down by the Supreme Court. You know, that's bad. A heckler's veto is supposed to be bad for the First Amendment. But the opposite of a heckler's veto in a class is what I call the trolls syllabus, which is letting the sort of bad faith question, the one that's really designed more to own the libs or shame someone else than actually engage with the learning objectives. The fact that, you know, someone on Twitter can say, hey, debate me, you're not like serious unless you debate me. But the reality is nobody actually gets to decide what your class is about. And if you're certain that a troll is, um, is really not there to advance what the learning objectives are, but they're there to make classmates feel bad, you know, you can just rest in the comforting arms of your learning objectives and say, actually, you know, this class isn't about uh, making our classmates feel bad. It's about, you know, these readings. Um, I, I hope that answered the question. I'm just looking through more stuff in the chat. And I see someone named Paul appeared to make a great point, but I'm scrolling up and not seeing what it was. So thank you for doing so, whatever it was. Um, any further Questions on free speech, pedagogy, leveling the playing field? I kind of um, zipped a bit past um, some of my concepts because I realized I we'd sort of spent longer on our little um, workshop. Um, what feels, if any, if anyone wants to share, what feels hopeful about this moment? As your, as as your university president, as your college president stated, there are, um, there's an enormous amount of challenge and pain right now. What feels, what feels great about doing this job and being in this place at this time? Oh, here comes a question from Amanda Klein. If both sides think they are equally right, how do you cross the wall of understanding? You can listen to understand, but the other side thinks that you personally need to do the learning and they have it right. So I think it really depends upon the topic. Um, one thing that I do with my students that I really like that I just started working on last, um, last academic year and have developed even more this year is I do these dialogue across difference projects and I don't ask the students to persuade each other. I'm just, even as, even as somebody who's a lawyer turned communications person, I'm, I'm just not that into debate. I don't ask students to persuade one another and I don't ask them to negotiate agreement, although I do like to train students in mediation techniques like the sort of getting to yes approach to um, principled negotiation, I think, is enormously valuable, and my student facilitators are trained in getting the yes techniques so that they can facilitate great conversations. 
But my dialogue across difference project that I have students do, um, it has as its central question, why is this so hard? And what I do is I select students, I'll select a topic like this semester in law and the political system, but one of the topics was defund the police, yes or no. So that's thing that people can feel very passionately about. And the assignment is to get a PhD in the opposing view, basically. Find out what values motivate the person with the opposing view. Find out all of the contours of their view. What, what do you mean by defund? Like all of the money? Which money? When? <laughs> what do you mean not by not defund? Like if I if, if the police budget is a billion dollars, if it's like one dollar less, like are you against that? So become become absolutely super literate in the person's reasoning, in the nature of what they mean, in the values that inform it, in the emotions that they feel when they hear the opposing side, and then jointly, and that person does that with you too, and the thing that they actually have to produce together is a report to legislators or community leaders planning to legislate or make change in this area, helping them to understand where the points of agreement and disagreement are, what things you're, you know, you're never going to get change on, and how best to communicate with someone who holds this opposing view based on you know, an understanding of what motivates them, what turns them off, what they really care about, what their real interests are as opposed to their position. And they become fluent in understanding why is this so hard and what is that other person about. And that's the entirety of the project. And I actually have students work on something like this as like a group project for a full, you know, three credit class over a matter of weeks. But there are all kinds of ways one can do this. There are many versions of this where if a, if a conversation is getting very hot in a class that I'm teaching, I'll actually go like, okay, freeze. <laughs> We're going to do an exercise where, you know, someone from this position speaks for three minutes and nobody gets to interrupt. Someone from that position speaks for three minutes and nobody gets to interrupt. And you have to report, you have to free write to, to articulate what the position is before you even question it. You have to like reflect back that you've understood it. Um, and I think that step of, of actually understanding that you could become almost like an anthropologist or a sociologist studying like, what do these defund people think? Um, that step of being able to just understand, just say, I, I don't have to do anything under, other than understand. Um, I don't have to agree. Um, can be really, really, really useful. I think one challenge um, and one challenge that I find is that um, is that in spite of being an incredibly polarized society, many of us are really uncomfortable just sitting with disagreement. And sitting with not knowing. Um, being able to flex that muscle of learning why someone you sit next to every day believes in having you know military vehicles for police departments when you believe in defunding and just understanding just just getting through learning and writing about it um i just only really take the temperature down and Lara, i just um i'm getting texts from people who are on here who are saying i just i really really hope that she's going to share her slides yes. um and I know that we're we're coming to a close and I don't want to cut you off, but I think we need like a 2.0, 3.0 future visits. This is the beauty of, of Zoom and hopefully what we'll be able to um, kind of the, the reintegration brings with us more opportunities to connect via Zoom when it's not all the time and a disconnect. And so I'm looking forward to hopefully being able to come back together with you. Um, a huge Thank you um, to yourself for sharing your time and the energy um, in a world where it's so easy to demonize and to polarize, but we don't get anywhere in, um, in relationship and in our world when we can disregard another human in that humanity. So 
your talk today is actually so relevant for so many things that I'm personally dealing with, but I know that we are dealing and struggling with um, in, as a society in every community, any circle that we're in. So um, just wanted to say thank you to you and, and to Hava and to Dr. Jan Zones and to Dr. Paul um, for joining us here today. Thanks very much for having me. And I, I actually just sent the Google Slides link um, to Hava. Um, yeah. I don't know, maybe make a PDF of it and um, so. yeah, we'll you. send it to the participant list. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Yeah, I think we're getting a lot of, we want the 2.0, the 3.0. There's so many terms there. Um, as people are hanging up, I'm just chatting, but there's so many um, ways to think about it that um, that you couch it like just, you know, right at the beginning, the, um, oh, where's your word? I took notes and I can't find my own notes, but but how you think about the classroom and, and how the humanity is different than the idea and a lot of these, these ways of, of looking at one another. And I love the freeze, the freeze game. I'm, I'm seriously gonna use that in my own household. Works in the classroom. And yeah, so the I, I do a managing hot <laughs> moments um, workshop and the, and the just stop everything thing. Yeah, I, I would love to stop everything at home, but I just put the quote in the chat. I usually like to leave with that and it's my favorite things. <laughs> Thank you, I'm, I'm glad that you did that. We'll make sure to include that in um, the slides when we send them out. And I'm, I'm sorry that I didn't ask for you to share that I remembered that you had wanted to, so thank you. Um, thank you all a ton, be safe and well. And I do hope um, for 2.0, it would be lovely to, to get to really talk more with, with all of you. I hope we have an opportunity to debrief a little bit. Lots of great information. I loved your paradigm shift. I mean, that really refocuses what should be going on in the classroom. I'm so glad, thank you. Um, it, as a lawyer, it's like, you know, the First Amendment is really nice, but it's, um, it's just a limitation on government. It's not a blueprint for how to live. It's not a school charter. It's, it's just a limitation on government. So I'm really glad that we share that vision. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Lara.